Uh, well, first of all, uh, to all of those that are connected, uh, a, a warm welcome to uh, to all of you. Uh, my name is Martin Herman. I'm the Danish permanent representative to uh, to the United Nations here in, in New York. Denmark is one of the four co-chairs of the Group of Friends of Sustainable Energy, the others being uh, uh, Norway, Ethiopia and, and Pakistan. And I have my my colleagues on the call uh, also. Uh, we are right now live uh, across the world, uh, across uh, continents, uh, uh, to welcome uh, all of you to uh, to this year's launch of the SDG uh, 7 tracking report. We are actually also live on UN uh, Web TV, so we are being broadcast uh, widely. Now, uh, you could say never has it been uh, been more important uh, to, uh, to to have the SDG 7 tracking uh, report out. The world agrees that we need to uh, build back uh, better and greener from uh, from COVID-19. And sustainable energy sits at the very heart of the nexus between climate change and sustainable uh, development goals. And in many ways, what gets measured uh, gets uh, gets done. We have an impressive uh, lineup of speakers uh, for you out there, so there is uh, much to uh, to look forward to. And without any further ado, uh, uh, we will we will uh, dive into the, the the first list of uh, the first list of speakers, an impressive range of uh, of ministers and and leaders in sustainable uh, in sustainable energy. Uh, our, our first uh, stop, if you like, on this tour of speakers is in uh, Addis Ababa, where we have a true visionary leader uh, on uh, on energy. Ethiopia was one of the uh, one of the two uh, co-leads for the energy transition track for the Climate Action Summit, and I myself have vivid memories of uh, uh, Minister Seleshi Bekele, uh, the Minister of Water, Irrigation and Energy in Ethiopia, keeping our feet to the fire and reminding us that we must be concrete, we must produce change on the ground. Minister uh, Bekele, over to you. wonders of modern technology. It seems we have lost for a moment, Minister uh, Bekele. I'm not, I'm too. Minister uh, Bekele, you are on mute. You have the floor. Yeah, okay. No, I'm, I'm in. Thank you so much. The mute was uh, difficult. Excellency Ministers, Ambassadors and Representatives of uh, Missions, Distinguished uh, Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, good morning on your Side in uh, New York, uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the virtual launching ceremony of Sustainable Development Goal 7 Tracking Report 2020. The government of Ethiopia is delighted and honored to organize today's virtual meeting to launch the SDG 7 Tracking Report with Denmark, Norway, and Pakistan, the co-chairs for Friends of Sustainable Energy. This special online event is intended to inform relevant discussion in support of the high-level political forum, the decade of action to deliver the SDGs, the implementation of the UN Decade of Sustainable Energy for All 2014 to 2024, and other related processes. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to immense suffering for people across the globe. No nation is being spared by its devastating impacts. The global health crisis has triggered economic and financial shocks, exposing and exacerbating existing vulnerabilities and inequalities, a reversal of hard-won development gains, and hampered the progress towards achieving the sustainable development goals of which SDG 7 is at its center. With the gradual spread of the virus, the virus in Africa, where most of the LDCs exist, Contaminant measures, containment measures, including social distancing and lockdowns, closing of schools and the closure of non-essential business and economic activities are expected to impact African economies with the potential to push millions of people into extreme poverty. Ethiopia's economy is not also immune to this reality. The scenario is even worse for the Ethiopian energy sector as this is the second year since the Ethiopian government launched the second national electrification program, NEP2, targeting to realize universal access to electricity by 2025. The plan is to implement one 8.2 million new grid connections 
and to 6 million beneficiaries to have access to off-grid solutions through standalone solar solution and mini grid technologies with strategic interventions of generations access and improving efficiency under national national electrification program too the covid 19 crisis forced us to slow down the projects that were in progress and to suspend the planned activities unfortunately also as energy is a significant enabler to implement COVID-19 response plans, including establishing quarantine, isolation and treatment centers, communications and information outreach activities that encourage behavioral change. It creates an additional burden on the sector. Thus, the energy sector is required to assess the full breadth of risk within the supply chain and to evaluate how COVID-19 may affect its services. For instance, due to the pandemic and the stay at home order, since mid March, electricity demand has substantially reduced. Consequently, peak generation has dropped off with an average 10% from that would have been generated under normal circumstances. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the new tracking SDG 7, the 2020 Energy Progress Report we are launching today tells us that significant progress had been made on various aspects of the SDG 7. This includes a reduction in the number of people worldwide lacking access to electricity, a strong uptake on, of renewable energy for electricity generation, and improvement in energy efficiency. Despite accelerated progress over the past decade, however, the world remains severely lagging to achieve universal access by 2030 unless efforts are scaled up significantly. Ethiopia has reached an access rate of 45%, of which 34% of the country's population has gained access to grid electricity, and 11% of the population was electrified with off-grid solutions. Even though Ethiopia expanded electrification at a rate more of more than 1% each year since 2010, this rate could not outpace population growth, where 55% out of the over 110 million inhabitants still live without electricity. Furthermore, available electricity per capita is very, very low and about 100 kilowatt hour per year per capita, one of the lowest in the world. Our efforts in harnessing renewable energy potential, like that of Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam, is imperative of continued existence in the modern world and sustainable de development remains, uh, uh, actually requires us to reach at least 500 kilowatt hour per capita per, per year. Achieving universal access to clean and sustainable cooking solution is also critical for the well-being of women and children, as well as emission reduction. For most Ethiopian households, firewood is a primary fuel for, followed by charcoal, approximately only 5% of the Households have access to clean cooking stove with electricity, LPG, and biogas as fuels. Ethiopia recognizes this, actually tries to bring um, green legacy so that afforestation and reforestation program uh, for greening Ethiopia and bringing forest back for uh, carbon sequestration and uh, enhancing also traditional energy source is really unimportant. Tomorrow, we launch the 2020 uh, 5 billion tree planting program uh, by our prime minister. Last year, we succeeded to plant 4 billion trees. So this is very well interlinked to the uh, energy issues and uh, uh, decarbonizing the world. Ethiopia recognizes that achieving its target of for universal access to modern energy requires a significant proportion of households, those in locations that are remote from the existing grid, be served by off-grid solution. Off-grid solutions, such as mini-grid, solar home system, and solar lanterns are key elements alongside grid expansion and densification to achieve universal access to modern energy system and thus reduce poverty and improve life chances. In order to achieve this, we are for finalizing the directives for mini-grid for the grant of business and operational license to operators in the off-grid uh, and the mini-grid sector. 
Our electricity system in Ethiopia is dominated by hydropower. So we are trying to diversify this uh, possibility. Uh, in such context, Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Hydro uh, provide opportunity for network installed capacity to get ahead of domestic consumer demand and thus accelerate economic growth. Hence, Ethiopia is also negotiating um, public-private uh, uh, power purchase agreement uh, through public-private agreement with Kenya uh, and other neighboring countries, uh, private sector investors to export power and enhance investment in Ethiopia. GERD project has been premised on exporting surplus energy and the revenue from the export is of significant importance to the finance package development uh, projects, including energy access projects in the rural community uh, of the country. Such large scale renewable energy from reliable source is also an important mechanism to enhance renewable energy development through energy mix. So East Africa Power Pool uh, therefore benefits from the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Plan. As highlighted in the SDG track report, the world access deficit countries are concentrated in Sub-Saharan Africa, which also receives disproportionately limited financing. Thus, they face challenges for expanding access to electricity, especially for clean technologies like renewable mini grids and off grid. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is therefore essential to increase government commitment, public institution, and financial uh, actors to mobilize proportionate resources during COVID-19 crisis. Ensuring access to reliable, affordable, sustainable, and modern energy services, and enhance institutional preparedness for future shocks. Finally, I would like to congratulate Internal Energy, International Energy Agency, ARENA, UNSD, World Bank, and WHO in producing this timely and needed report as we implement the Paris Agreement, the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and our African Union's Agenda 2063 in the light of this unprecedented crisis. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Bekele, for your leadership, not only nationally, but also regionally, and for this sort of tour de force of, of all that, that, uh, that Ethiopia is doing. Now move, uh, now move on to, uh, to the two ministers uh, that, of course, are of particular importance to me because they are my political uh, masters. Now, the first is a, is a minister who arrived at the Climate Action Summit in New York uh, last year, saying that the task was not to do what is possible, but to do what is necessary. Uh, he has since then been working very, very hard on making uh, the necessary possible, uh, delivering on Denmark's commitment to a 70% reduction of greenhouse gases in, in 2030. It's my distinct pleasure to give the floor to the Danish Minister for, uh, for Climate uh, and Energy, uh, Dan Jansen. Minister, the floor is yours. So we're not hearing the minister. Hold on. I can't apparently have a connection problem with the minister. Uh, we tested before. Um, I think technician will be needed on the Denmark side to check there. On now? Is it working now? You are on. Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Martin, and uh, excellencies, uh, dear guests. As co-chair of Friends of Sustainable Energy, Denmark is delighted to launch the Tracking SDG 7 Energy Progress Report for 2020. Uh, I share the honor with my Danish colleague, the Minister for Development Cooperation, and uh, colleagues from Pakistan, Ethiopia and Norway. Congratulations to IRENA and the other SDG 7 custodians for a very thorough and important status on the implementation of SDG 7. It is very positive to see that we are making progress in achieving the important sustainable development goal on sustainable, sustainable energy for all. Energy is key in our continued effort to combat climate change. Therefore, Denmark continues political leadership on SDG 7 as announced by our Prime Minister uh, at the UN Climate Action Summit uh, last September. We had a very fruitful cooperation with our colleagues from Ethiopia and a coalition of other ambitious countries and international organizations. 
most of you are here today. Uh, the corporation uh, led the energy transition track at the summit in New York in September. It demonstrated that we can achieve what we can achieve when we work together. We still, still have a long road ahead before we all have access to sustainable energy. The worldwide pandemic we are in the middle of right now has made the road more difficult. But it has also provided us with an opportunity to rethink where we direct our investments. Once immediate life-saving interventions are in place, we need to consider how to recover in the short, medium and long term, and make sure that recovery is built on the basis of investments in green transition. We need to make green transition the basis for sustainable growth and job creation. According to the tracking report, renewable energy constitutes 17.3% of the global energy mix. It is vital that we use this point in time to accelerate investments in energy transition. That is, renewable energy solutions as well as energy efficiency in all countries. In parallel, we need to seize the low prices on fossil fuels to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies and support the phase out of coal. In Denmark, the crisis, both the imminent one and the climate crisis, have compelled us to ramp up renewable energy production drastically. A key component in the plan is to build two giant artificial energy islands, one in the North Sea and one in the Baltic Sea. This will require massive investments. I'd like to highlight the tremendous importance of mobilizing private investments and finance. In addition, and to succeed, it is imperative that the public and private sector work together. Danish pension funds have invested massively in offshore wind farms, both in Denmark and abroad. I expect pension funds to be pivotal also in the financing of the future Danish energy islands. It is positive that global investments in green energy in developing countries have doubled since 2010, but at the same time it is worrying that only 12% is directed towards the least developed countries, who are in dire need of support. It is paramount that we commit to our promises and direct investments towards the most vulnerable countries. 2020 is a crucial year, so we need to redouble efforts on all fronts. We only have about 10 years left until 2030 and much work still needs to be done. We need to commit to higher climate ambitions in the NDCs this year, sustainable energy plans and an integral part of meeting both the objectives of the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, and I know you have to uh, leave uh, soon, so thank you so much for taking time. Uh, do this and also highlight, in fact, that the critical here is actually to, to invest in, 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 in renewable energy and invest uh, essentially uh, in, in the future and our efforts to build back uh, better. Now, next uh, next on the list is, is, uh, is the second of my, my political masters, the Danish Minister for Development Corporation. And I could tell you many stories about uh, Minister Brain, but I'm going to tell you one. And that is on his first day in office uh, last year, uh, the minister did something which has become very fashionable uh, these days. He declared himself to be Minister uh, of Solidarity. Well, since then, the world, I suppose, has realized that solidarity uh, is security, solidarity is uh, welfare, solidarity is progress. Over to you, Minister Prank. We look forward to hearing from you. There is no doubt that solidarity is the center of all our work, also here when it comes to energy. Excellences, uh, colleagues, and friends, I strongly commend the custodian agencies for the 2020 Tracking SDG 7 Energy Progress Report. The report is important for at least three reasons. Firstly, I, it highlights that despite pro progress, we are nowhere near being on track to achieve SDG 7 by 2030 at the current speeds. Secondly, it underlines the multiple benefits of investing in access to renewable energy and energy transition to achieve the SDG and the Paris Agreement. And thirdly, it underlined that we more than ever need political leadership to ensure faster and more ambitious action. 
COVID-19 has reinforced the urgency of action, reinforced the need to increase resilience and to build back better and greener. Recovery must indeed be based on green transition. We cannot go back to the pre-corona normal, where climate change caused by emission undermined decades of development progress. Access to renewable energy is key to developing sustainable, carbon neutral and climate resilient society. It's essential at national level, community level, in cities and to households. And the most vulnerable need it the most. It's unacceptable that in 2020, 780 million people still do not have access to electricity, most of them in Africa. And it's intolerable that since 2010, until today, almost 3 billion people do not have access to clean cooking. Globally, air pollution is killing 7 million people every day. Women and children suffer the most from respiratory disease caused by a lack of access to clean cooking fuel. Ensuring access not only to energy, but to renewable energy for all will improve livelihoods, human well-being, reduce hunger and strengthen reliances, uh, resilience as well as climate adaptation. Accelerating SDG 7 is possible within one big decade. One billion has gained access to electricity. Today, in many places, renewable are the cheaper option compared to fossil energy. Hence, in the coming years, Denmark will intensify efforts to ensure clean energy access for all. We need more action faster. We must race to the challenges. We must engage the private sector for solutions, innovation and investments to ensure renewable energy for all, leaving no one behind. It's a matter of solidarity. Solidarity across countries, solidarity between countries, as well as solidarity across and between generations. We are the ones asked to take up that challenge. Let us answer with bold action. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Prane, uh, for, for this rallying call, uh, pointing out also that it can be done and that it must be done in, in, in partnerships, uh, and, and in partnerships both for climate and for development. And, and I think most importantly, as you said, uh, both for today and for tomorrow, that intergenerational uh, aspect of it. Now, the next speaker uh, on, on, on our list uh, is, another, is another visionary uh, coming from, from Pakistan that has taken very, very bold steps when it comes to exploring uh, possibilities of harnessing what you might call uh, the powers of the wind. It's my distinct pleasure to give now the floor to, uh, to Minister Omar Ayub uh, Khan, Minister of, of Energy in, in Pakistan. Minister Khan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to join the global launch of SDG 7 Tracking Report and the SDG 7 Policy Brief from the platform of Group of Friends of Sustainable Energy. I'm also honored to mention that Pakistan is part of the technical advisory group responsible for preparation of the SDG Policy Brief and our very able and competent and, uh, experienced uh, Ambassador Munir Akram is also uh, joining us in this forum. You can see him on the screen. Uh, Excellencies, in 2015, we pledged to leave no one behind. Today, COVID-19 pandemic reaffirmed our pledge as now none of us is safe unless everyone is safe. This pandemic has witnessed the urgent need to provide electricity for health facilities as around 1 billion people around the world are currently provided health measures at health facilities without electricity. 
Achieving universal access to electricity is indispensable to meet our pledge and achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Because of its cross-cutting nature, advancement in SDG 7 has the potential to spur progress across SDGs of poverty eradication, social equality, mitigation of and adaptation to climate change, food security, health, education, sustainable cities and communities, clean water and sanitation, productive employment, innovation, and transport. SDG 7 cross-cutting nature has been acknowledged in the latest Global Sustainable Development Report. We also know that the energy sector accounts for two-thirds of the total greenhouse gas emissions and 80% of the CO2 emissions. And therefore, rapid deployment of renewable energy coupled with energy efficiency can reduce emissions by about 90% in the energy sector by 2030. This creates a compelling case to ensure that every effort towards the realization of the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement must include SDG 7. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the SDG 7 suggests uneven progress in targets. However, one message is clear. We are not moving fast enough. The global population without access to electricity fell from about 1.2 billion a decade ago to less than 800 million today. But still, a lot needs to be done to achieve universal access by 2030. On renewable energy, we are seeing rapid progress in the power sector, but far less in transportation, industry, heating, and cooling. We are making gains in energy efficiency, but not at the pace needed to double energy productivity by 2030. Most disturbingly, access to clean cooking fuels and technologies continues to lag furthest behind all other targets resulting in about 4 million premature deaths annually because of indoor air pollution caused by inefficient cooking practices. Excellency, acknowledging the cross-cutting nature of the SDG 7 on affordable and clean energy, Pakistan has taken several measures to improve access to clean energy. Over the past 10 years, access to electricity has increased by 8%. The proportion of population relying on fuel Clean fuels and technology has also increased by 11%. Investment in renewable energy technologies like solar, biomass, micro small hydro has increased by many fold during the last three to four years. Our CO2 emissions have also been reduced by improving the share of renewables energy mix, which currently stands at 11% and is expected to increase to 30% by 2030. We established the Alternative Energy Development Board along with the Private Power and Infrastructure Board to act as a one-window facilitator for renewable energy and power development. We are also exploring with the sugar mills the development of the gas or biomass co-based generation projects on the framework of for power co-generation. A notable undertaking has been the construction and operationalization of the Kaidazm Solar Park. Park. Pakistan's first utility large scale solar power plant of about 1000 megawatts. Another step towards adopting clean energy was taken by the Parliament of Pakistan, which has the distinction of being the world's first largest solar power legislative building. The government has also decided to solarize 20,000 schools across the province of Punjab while focusing on remote areas as well. Pakistan also has a largely unutilized but identified solar potential and wind power potential of 40,000 megawatts of electricity generation, which I alluded to earlier. Our new policy on renewable energy aims to focus on affordable energy pro projects that can increase our share in the, min in the energy mix to 20% in 2025 and 30% by the year 2030, in line with the maximum, a, magum, a megawatt saved is better. Improving energy efficiency and conservation are among Pakistan's top priorities. A National Energy Efficiency and, conversation, and Conservation Authority, NICA, has been established to identify energy efficiency and conservation opportunities, and we have given this body new targets to achieve. 
according to the World Bank, on measuring regulatory indicators for sustainable energy and comparing sustainable, sustainable energy. For all at the global level, Pakistan's score on renewable energy is 77, which is higher than other countries in South Asia, and we endeavor to do better in the coming years. Excellencies, global achievement of SDG 7 is possible only if we all take immediate action together to scale up our efforts. Global energy investment is expected to fall by 20% or $400 billion compared with the outgoing year of 2019 last year. However, we need to triple them from the current level of 1.3 to $1.4 trillion until 2030. There is a need to mobilize finance for the developing countries. We also need to invest in the capacity, in the capacity building of the developing countries to enable them to develop bankable projects to easily access funding. At the country level, everyone should demonstrate greater ambition, strong policy action, and induce energy market reforms like introducing carbon pricing instruments and promoting mobility. We must also work to remove persistent financial, regulatory, and technological barriers that hinder the achievement of the SDG 7. We must also remain watchful that our focus on COVID-19 pandemic should not distract us from the achievement of our 2030 agenda as a whole. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that a strong multi-stakeholder partnership will remain key to mobilize and share knowledge, expertise, technology, and financial resources. I would also like to emphasize that the United Nations' central role to engage the relevant stakeholders in the implementation of the SDG 7 targets in the decade of action will be instrumental and the key underpinning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Khan, and for highlighting, I think most importantly, the interlinkages between uh, SDG 7 and, and all the uh, other uh, SDGs, uh, and highlighting the fact that the Global Sustainable Development Report from last year, of course, pointed out that exactly SDG 7 about access to energy, about uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency is identified as one of the key levers if we want to deliver uh, on Paris and on the Sustainable Development Goals. Get energy right and you'll get there. Get energy wrong and we won't. Thank you so much. It's now my pleasure to uh, to turn to our uh, Norwegian brothers and, and sisters, uh, State Secretary uh, Axel Jakobsen uh, from, uh, from Norway. State Secretary, uh, the floor is yours. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic represents a tragedy for its victims and their families. And the economic hardship for hundreds of millions around the globe. While COVID-19 is the most urgent threat facing humanity today, we cannot allow ourselves to forget that climate change is the most serious challenge over the long term. But in the midst of crisis lies opportunities. Global recovery from COVID-19 can put the world on a path for a safe, healthy, just and sustainable future leaving no one behind. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change provide a clear roadmap. They set the course we need to follow. The SDG 7 tracking report to be presented later today sends mixed signals about our advancement towards our targets. The good news are some progress on access to electricity and renewables. Wind and solar generation is now cheaper than electricity generated conventionally by new built coal and natural gas plants almost everywhere. The bad news, we are failing on clean cooking and energy efficiency. The message is clear. We need to step up action, raise ambitions and deliver. The cost of inaction is high. As the Danish Minister Prehn uh, underlined, it is unacceptable that around 800 million people lack access to electricity and about 3 billion people use dirty fuel for cooking. One in four healthcare facilities in sub-Saharan Africa does not have access to electricity. 
carbon emissions are increasing fast. The most vulnerable populations, including women and girls, are the hardest hit. Colleagues, COVID-19 is causing a major di disruption in the energy sector. Our limited progress risks to be wiped out. The COVID-19 crisis also highlights the critical role electricity plays in powering the modern world, as well as the growing need for clean, reliable and affordable energy. We need to build resilience into the economy overall and the energy system will be a very big part of that going forward. The timing is right to accelerate the clean energy transition and incorporate recovery and sustainable development plans in the updated national determined contributions to climate action that are due under the Paris Agreement this year. Norway, as the first developed country, submitted its uh, NDCs with enhanced ambitions. Our target is to reduce emissions by 50 to 55% by 2030. We need to raise our ambitions, increased investments, increased investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency could take us a long way to achieve the Paris targets. Climate change and renewable energy is a priority in Norway, Norway's development policies. For us, ensuring that no one is left behind, mobilization of investments from private sector and developing de-risking de instruments are key priorities. Norway as a large energy nation has considerable experience, expertise and technology that can support SDG 7 action. We need to ensure that sustainable development and climate action are firmly embedded in the large-scale recovery spending now being pledged, using this as an opportunity to accelerate transition towards a low carbon economy. Achieving SDG 7 could be a, should be a key priority in our joint efforts to build back better and greener. The Energy Progress Report and the SDG 7 policy briefs will be launched today. Uh, that will be launched today give us an excellent basis for scaling up ambitions and actions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. T. Jacobsen, uh, for, um, for basically uh, illustrating uh, the need to raise ambition uh, and, 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 and look at this not as costs, but actually as uh, alternative costs. What is the price of, uh, of, of inaction? Now, the challenge always is, you know, how do you turn uh, one-liners and, and, and good speeches into concrete uh, action on the ground? And I know this is very much the focus of, uh, of the next uh, speaker who will deliver uh, special remarks uh, because that has been the focus uh, for her throughout her entire uh, career. She is, if anything, a doer uh, and she knows that it can be done because she has done it. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to give the floor to the uh, to Damilola Uginvi, who will speak on behalf of the Secretary General as the CEO and uh, Special Representative of the Secretary General on sustainable energy role. Damilola, are you there? We are looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, yes, I am here. Um, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and dear colleagues, I'm delighted to join you today on behalf of the UN Secretary General and provide these special remarks on the SDG 7 progress. Energy is the golden thread to the SDGs, and I'm grateful to the continued leadership of the Secretary General on a sustainable energy transition for all that can help us meet our global goals. Thank you to the co-chairs of the Group of Friends of Sustainable Energy for hosting today's event. And thank you to the SDG 7 data custodians for this year's Tracking SDG 7 report. Despite some progress, this year's Tracking SDG 7 report is clear. We are off track to meet SDG 7 by 2030. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, progress to meet universal energy access was too slow. The reality is COVID-19 risks derailing progress on energy access unless we act now. This year's tracking SDG 7 report highlights pockets of positive progress and also where we must focus our collective efforts to meet the SDG 7 challenge. 
the latest data shows that electricity access has continued to grow, but not fast enough, with 789 million people still lacking access to electricity today. This means despite steady growth, the pace of electrification is still falling short of what is needed to achieve universal electricity access. More worryingly is that 2.8 billion people still lack access to clean cooking. We must be clear in this moment, the world is failing to answer the clean cooking challenge. If current trends persist, 31% of the global population will have no access to clean cooking by 2030. While COVID-19 creates a major challenge, it also creates a major opportunity to reset and address slow progress. As we plan our recovery, we must use this moment to redefine what we expect and understand as energy access. Energy access cannot just be considered as a minimum level of access, but energy for development, for productive use and economic opportunity. This can help millions of people live dignified, healthy and prosperous lives. We must renew our commitments to integrated energy transition that accelerates the pace of progress of access, prioritizes efficiency and supports faster growth of renewables to achieve SDG 7. We must accelerate the transition of as COVID-19 has shown us how energy access actually saved lives. A lack of energy access has a potential to magnify the human catastrophe and significantly slow a social and economic recovery from the virus. As the world continues to rebuild from the pandemic, we are faced with the unique opportunity once in our generation to actually recover better. If we recover better, we can reset our economies to enable greater economic and social development and improve the livelihoods for millions of people. This reset can spark the progress to meet SDG 7 at the scale and the speed we need to actually implement on ground in countries. It's clear if we go back to business as usual and trends continue, we will not deliver on the promise of universal energy access. We can no longer accept this incremental rate of progress. This recovery must also be a recovery for all. Through COVID-19, we've seen the regional divide of energy access progress even more clearly and cannot risk leaving entire regions behind. This year's tracking report data shows energy access challenge remains heavily concentrated in Africa. The entire continent has only improved by less than 20 million people, which is almost like half of what India or Bangladesh have done, and they are countries. Africa is a region full of promise and a growing econ economic powerhouse, yet this progress is stifled without access to modern, reliable, and affordable energy. To support countries in this critical moment, later on this month, UN Energy and SE4 will release a set of guidelines for African and Caribbean countries to recover better, help to rebuild their economies and rethink their energy supplies post COVID-19. These guidelines will help support government to take important measures to recover better, to deliver universal access, grow resilient economies and create new green jobs. In this recover better opportunities, Governments should invest in both renewables, renewable energy heavily, and we're also encouraging that this forms a big part of their stimulus package. And why we're saying this is simple. You could actually see the multiplier effects of GDP when you invest in renewable energy. Investments in clean energy produce 3.5 times the number of jobs as the same investments in fossil fuel. Moreover, Renewable energy technologies are able to come in to equal or cheaper than the fossil fuel competitors. We're very glad to hear that big countries like Nigeria have removed their fossil fuel subsidy, which is something that people never imagined would happen. And we will continue to encourage that happens around the continent and around the world. 
Countries will also see improvements in healthcare, agriculture, and gender. A gender-inclusive approach is particularly key as the research shows wages for women with access to energy are 59% higher than those without access to energy. The benefits of recovering better with sustainable energy for all are clear. Demonstratable return on investment, a more resilient economy, healthier population, and a cleaner environment. We must all work together and seize this unique momentum and this opportunity to keep the promise of sustainable energy for all. I would like to take this opportunity to thank again the co-chairs of the group of Friends of Sustainable Energy for All and the data custodians of the tracking SDG7 report. Thank you for listening. Samilola, thank you so much for pointing out the real challenges uh, out there uh, and those, of course, uh, particularly pertaining to, to Africa, but also pointing out that this is no time for hesitation. This is a time for determination to shift tracks uh, and to get uh, get on with the job, uh, with the scale and, and acceleration that is indeed uh, needed. Now, the next speaker uh, on our list is a very dear colleague uh, of mine and a good friend, herself and, and, and a seemingly inexhaustible source of, uh, of renewable uh, energy, uh, the president of uh, the UN's Economic and Social Council, Her Excellency uh, Mona Yul. Mona, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. Excellencies, colleagues, it is a great pleasure to join you today to discuss progress on SDG 7 and explore policy options to accelerate its achievement. The current COVID-19 crisis has laid bare the inequality that exists in our communities, with those most vulnerable also suffering the most. Our common task of achieving the 2030 Agenda and leaving no one behind has never been more urgent and necessary. We must act decisively to build back greener, to combat climate disruption and environmental destruction. This means aligning our recovery efforts with the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. We cannot tackle these global crises without a global response. Universal access to clean, affordable and modern energy services is an important part of leaving no one behind. This has become even more evident in the context of COVID-19. In many countries, electricity access has been a crucial element of the response to the pandemic by governments and communities alike. Colleagues, a clean energy transition can help us simultaneously achieve our goals on the SDGs and climate change. It can reduce emissions, strengthen res resilience and fuel economic recovery through innovation and creating new jobs. This in turn contributes to achieving other vital goals on poverty reduction and the empowerment of women. But it is our effort. But if our effort are to be impactful, it is fundamental that our action be guided by data. With accurate data, we can understand the complexity and the challenges we face, and it identify the most appropriate policy solutions in support of a clean energy transition. It can also illuminate the interlinkages between the SDG 7 and the realization of many other SDGs. This is why I welcome this timely launch of the Energy Progress Report and the SDG Policy Brief. I congratulate the SDG 7 Indicator Custodian Agencies under the Chairmanship of IRENA on their collaboration to deliver a new edition of the SDG 7 Energy Progress Report. And I wish to commend the outstanding work of the multi-stakeholder SDG 7 Technical Advisory Group. The reports and the policy briefs launched today show how much we can achieve by working together in a coordinated manner. And I, and, and I anticipate that they will also inform our discussion at the high level political forum this year. So I thank the co-host for convening this meeting and look forward to our continued engagement on this critical issue. Thank you. 
so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mona, uh, not only for your intervention, but for all the work that you're doing as president of, of ECOSOC, uh, keeping keeping Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals uh, on the on the agenda, also as our discussions on recovery from COVID-19 uh, carries uh, on an inspiration to, uh, to all of us. We now move into a global launch of of, uh, of, of tracking SDG 7, the Energy Progress Report. And uh, we now uh, move across the world a little bit further east, uh, all the way to, uh, to Abu Dhabi, uh, where a true uh, leader and expert in the field uh, and a very good friend uh, and collaborator uh, is sitting uh, ready to take for Francesco uh, Camera, the Director General of the International Renewable Energy uh, Agency. Francesco, uh, are you there? Then the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin, and uh, really a pleasure to be with you today. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I wish at the outset, on behalf of the SDG7 Custodian Agency, to thank the Group of Friends of Sustainable Energy, in particular its co-chair, Denmark, Ethiopia, Norway and Pakistan, for hosting this important uh, launch event. I I would like also to express my appreciation to UN DESA for facilitating the collaborative work under the SDG 7 Technical Advisory Group, including the group's valuable, valuable input to the Energy Progress Report. We look forward to sharing with you, with you here today. And naturally, I wish to thank the, the chair of the group, Ansolov Ibrek, Ibrek, for uh, this continuous engagement. Allow me also to uh, express my thanks to the ministers of this country that has opened our meeting today. And I really thank all of them for their leadership. Carolina, it has been a great pleasure to chair the preparatory work of the 2020 edition of a tracking at the G7 Energy Progress Report. In such time of crisis, it is more important than ever that the leading international organizations come together and put forward evidence-based analysis that can help shape the global response and recovery measures. I would like to thank our fellow SDG7 custodian agency, IA, UN Statistics Division, World Bank, and WHO for the excellent collaboration over the past year. This year's reports come at the time when the world is grappling with the worst health and economic crisis in modern times. The COVID-19 pandemic underscored the need for affordable, reliable, and modern energy access. Let us for a facility to treat patients and store vaccine for camps to supply community with clean water or for people to benefit from digital technologies. With over a billion people having gained access to electricity over the last decade, the 2020 edition of the Energy Progress Report sent a clear message that some progress, prog promising progress toward SDG 7 has been made. It can aware that efforts are far behind what is needed to reach universal access to by 2030, and that the COVID-19 pandemic could derail plans unless we ensure sustainable energy is an integral part of the global response. Gently stepping up action toward SDG 7 targets contributes to also reach other SD, SDGs goal and overcome the economic crisis and severe unemployment resulting from COVID-19 pandemic. We have clear evidence that a more ambitious energy transition toward accelerate uptake of renewables, energy efficiency and energy access will bring both higher G GDP and employment growth. Importantly, this includes for the first year of investment, which is critical in the current crisis. By 2030, jobs in renewable energy will travel <clears throat> to almost 20 million, up from 12 million in 2018. And uh, my colleague uh, and friends, uh, Roy Kana from World Bank, Maria Nira from WHO, Rabia Peruki from Marina, Dave Tark from IA will come into the details of uh, uh, the funding of uh, our report. Low policies and investment decisions today can put us on this pathway. 
we must ensure recovery packages accelerate the shift to sustainable economies and resilience, including including society. Many change package a holistic approach that integrate the short-term investment stimulus with long-term transition policies and strategies is simply essential. The Energy Progress Report presents policymakers and development partners with global, regional, and country-level data to inform such decisions and identify priorities for sustainable recovery that couple as the G7 acceleration with vigorous post-COVID response. In concluding, I'd like on behalf of the Custodian Agency to take once to thank one more the UN for entrusting us with the responsibility to track progress on the Sustainable Development Goal 7. We hope that our funding will strengthen the momentum for action and will prove a useful input to the review and implementation of the 2030 agenda. I look forward to our continued collaboration with the UN and the custodian agency of the Energy Progress Report. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Marco. Francesco, thank you so much for that for that overview, but also for, for the leadership that, that you continue to provide uh, in setting in setting renewable energy uh, on the uh, on the agenda, both for uh, public institutions, for governments, but also very much for private sector demonstrators. Uh, the business case is out there. Now, the next person we turn to is is another is another good friend and collaborator, a strong partner from the preparation for the climate action summit, but more importantly, from the follow up. Uh, uh, it's my distinct pleasure now to give the floor to uh, to Rohit Khanna, uh, program manager uh, at the uh, energy sector uh, uh, management assistance program uh, of the Rohit. You have the floor. Martin, thank you very much. Uh, very nice to see you again. I hope you are doing well. Uh, excellencies, uh, it's a pleasure for, for, for me to join you today to, to present uh, the, uh, the main messages from the SDG 7 Progress Report. Uh, so first of, all, first of all, I would like to, to thank very much uh, uh, Director General Lacamara and the IRENA uh, for <coughs> very effectively chairing uh, the uh, SDG 7 2020 report. Uh, we are very proud to have worked together with uh, our fellow custodian agencies and an SMAP to serve as the secretariat uh, for the report. Um, I would like to um, uh, sort of uh, go through some key messages. Uh, I think the first is that uh, it's clear the world has made significant progress over the last decade in increasing access to electricity. Uh, and I think the work of governments, of civil society, of development partners has clearly paid off. Um, the share of the world's population having access to electricity grew from 83% in 2010 to 90% in 2018, an increase of more than 1 billion people, uh, outpacing the overall growth of the population. Um, despite that accelerated progress over the past decade, the world is unfortunately expected to fall short of the SDG 7 target, as other speakers have mentioned before me. Uh, currently, about 790 million people still lack access to electricity in 2018. And this number is even higher when we take into account issues of reliability, affordability, and quality. Um, unfortunately, if we project out existing policies, 620 million will still remain without access in 2030. So we would have achieved access of about 93% uh, by 2030, um, with 85% of this population in Sub-Saharan Africa. So a lot of progress has been made in Latin America and the Caribbean, in Eastern and Southeastern Asia, uh, but unfortunately, uh, we, we project that uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the access rates uh, will remain low relative to the rest of the world. Um, now, this does not take into account yet the potential impacts from the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are already seeing uh, impacts that will affect electrification. So just as an example, uh, here are some sort of points to consider. You know, 40% of power in sub-Saharan Africa is supplied by independent power producers, uh, representing over 19 gigawatts 
uh, about $38 billion of investment. And, and we are concerned that security of supply is at risk if and when uh, the take or pay obligations are not honored for these power purchase agreements. Secondly, uh, if you look at the impact on utilities due to reduced demand, due to uh, uh, payment deferrals and so on, uh, the number of utilities pre-crisis that uh, were able to uh, uh, have operational cost recovery was about 39, was 39. We uh, anticipate that this number will drop to 10 post COVID. Uh, and so th there are very significant implications for the, the utilities. There's also very significant implications that we see happening on the off grid and mini grid sector. Uh, Sustainable Energy for All conducted a survey and, and found that uh, to two thirds to three quarters of surveyed companies have only two months or less of operating expenses available. Uh, so many of them are not going to survive more than three to four months. And we are relying on these off grid and mini grid companies uh, to uh, provide uh, essential electricity services, um, not just during the crisis, but certainly for achieving the 2030 goals. Um, We've also seen that uh, this, this, this pandemic uh, has brought home the message of how important it is uh, that we ensure that public institutions, that, that the human capital is addressed in electrification. 70% uh, of healthcare facilities in Africa do not have access to reliable electricity, and one in four have no electricity at all. Uh, and so this is a time for us to redouble our efforts on providing reliable electricity uh, to health facilities and for the electricity sector, the energy sector, uh, are both off-grid, mini-grid and utilities uh, to be able to contribute to building back better uh, post-crisis. Now, looking ahead, uh, I think one of the key features is that uh, is the unevenness, the inequality uh, on the access gap. Closing the access gap uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, is increasingly challenging uh, and requires strong commitments and integrated approaches, um, the last mile will surely be very, very difficult. Um, the world's access deficit is increasingly concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this is where the access battle will be won or lost. Uh, more than half of the region's population lacked access uh, as of 2018. Um, unfortunately, some very large countries in the region uh, are not keeping up with population growth. Uh, and uh, as a result, this has really set back uh, the overall access numbers uh, in the region. At the same time, there is also good news and models to follow. Some countries such as Kenya and Uganda have shown the most improvement since 2010. Uh, Ethiopia and Rwanda have made significant progress uh, and, 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 and Martin also talked about the, the, the tremendous work that Damilola has done in Nigeria, where a very ambitious electrification uh, program mm -hmm. is underway. Um, so this inequality is, is both regional, but also we must take into account even within countries, the inequality. Uh, in all of the 20 high access deficit countries, the top quintile of the population has four times better access than the bottom quintile. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there's an urban-rural divide. Although the pace of electrification picked up in rural areas between 2010 and 2018, the world's rural areas continue to have lower levels of access to electricity, with only about 80% of access to electricity and 668 million people unserved in 2018. And in sub-Saharan Africa, electrification in urban areas is not keeping up with population growth. Uh, furthermore, uh, we see that the access gap is particularly concentrated in low-income countries and those affected by fragility, conflict, and violence. Globally, more than half of the unserved population lives in these low-income countries, and about one-third of unserved people live in fragile and conflict-affected contexts. Uh, and so for us to really address uh, these, let me outline what I, in, in, in conclusion, what we think are very important sort of policy directions going forward. Firstly, as countries consider options for recovery and economic stimulus post COVID-19, it will be very important to balance, of course, the immediate response measures with longer term strategies that ensure sustainable benefit. 
This means prioritizing electrification efforts that will ensure energy access for health and sanitation and averting disconnections among the poorest and most vulnerable energy consumers, supporting utilities and essential electricity providers to maintain service continuity, but also thinking about how renewable energy, energy access, energy efficiency can be part of the stimulus to create new jobs and to reduce the fiscal burden on uh, economies. Finally, to close out, there, there needs to be a package of measures that countries will need to take in order to accelerate the pace of electrification. First, sector reforms to reduce the risk and uncertainty facing private sector participation and to improve utility financial viability. Mm -hmm. Second, promote regional trade to optimize energy resources regionally, lower the cost of energy, enhance affordability to largely poor consumers and mitigate the risk of supply shortages. Third, foster demand and improve affordability through productive uses, income generating uh, measures, increase the emphasis on leaving no one behind, given that the largest population, proportion of the population that access is in remote, rural, poor, and vulnerable communities. And finally, continue a strong focus on planning to establish low cost, low carbon pathways that integrate grid improvements, mini grid and off grid technologies. These this package has been shown clearly that in many countries to help substantially accelerate electricity access. So thank you very much for your attention, Martin. Thank you very much. Over to my uh, colleagues from the WHO. Thank you so much, uh, Rohit, uh, for pointing out um, to some extent um, what is a, a very, very important aspect that the last mile will be uh, difficult. And what we need to do is essentially getting it right across many different spheres, and that essentially we can only get it right uh, together. We now move on to, uh, to Maria Nera, uh, Director of Public Health and Environment in the WHO. Uh, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, colleagues, uh, friends from different agencies, uh, excellencies. It's really very exciting to be here today talking about the future. You know, as you can imagine, for WHO, uh, it, has been, uh, it is still a very difficult time where we are fully involved in the response to the pandemic. But at the same time, we are starting to see that we need to help as well on, on, uh, on supporting countries on what it could be a healthy and green recovery. And in that sense, uh, the shock that the COVID-19 has represented for all of us is already giving us some lessons. One of the lessons is that we need to be better prepared next time. And the, the better prepared means on our relationship with the ecosystems and nature, we need to make sure that those zoonotic diseases will not come back again if we can reduce or minimize the risk. Second, people doesn't want to go back now the same way we went or were before the, the, the crisis. People doesn't want to see pollution again I think that uh, the, the terrible lockdown that has created such a suffering and terrible social and economic consequences at the same time, they gave us a kind of unexpected uh, outcomes like uh, the, 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 the increase on, uh, on air quality resulting from those measures on, on, on the, uh, to, to ensure the lockdown. So people don't want to go back this, to this pollution that is affecting their health. And clearly, they want us, institutions, uh, international organizations, governments, to take any measure to reduce health vulnerability. And one critical way to reduce health vulnerability will be to build those kind of green walls to protect our health and having access to modern energy, reliable and sustainable sources of energy will be a very strong uh, wall, green wall, to protect our health. So I think more than ever, uh, uh, so in WHO we did this, what we call the manifesto, looking at some uh, prescriptions for, for a healthy and green recovery. And two of the prescriptions, two of the six prescriptions are very much related to what we are discussing here. One is access to clean sources of energy, clean, modern, available, and affordable sources of energy. And another one is related to subsidies for fossil fuels. But let me, let me present to you now what are the main outcomes of the report. Um, as you can see, 
see access to clean fuels and technologies for cooking time is getting better. So the, the, the share of the, the, the global population with access to clean cooking fuel cleaning cooking fuels and technology has increased from uh, 66 to 63. So good news is still, of course, far from what we want to achieve, but feasible. However, once again, it, it was mentioned already by other colleagues, we still have almost 3 billion people cooking and heating and, and lightening their house uh, on a very smoky environment, which puts our lungs once again at major risk, increasing vulnerability, particularly in the time where uh, epidemics of uh, respiratory diseases like the, the, the one we are currently facing uh, represent a major problem. And of course, the, the, the terrible uh, number of more than 4 million premature deaths caused by exposure to this um, uh, household uh, in pollution in a place where the household where we should be uh, the most protected. Next one, please. Another important uh, uh, conclusion of the report is that we still have a major urban and rural divide. Obviously, this is not a surprise. We can see that in, in urban areas, access to gas, LPG, natural or biogas is, is uh, the predominantly used fuel. And uh, in rural areas, it's still very much unprocessed biomass, biomass which is very uh, of major concern for our, for our for our health. It's true that the access is, is clearly high uh, uh, in in urban areas. It's around 83% access to clean fuels for cooking and, and technologies, while it's, it's 37% in, in in rural areas. So a major effort in, in terms of defining policies and looking at now how we use uh, those uh, stimulus packages and then all the investment that the countries need to do to, to ensure this very much needed uh, economic recovery. We all need to, to go against this uh, recession that everybody's uh, announcing. And it's clear that investing on, on, on this type of clean energy, sustainable, modern energy will be a very good way to ensure to ensure an economic uh, uh, recovery as well. Many jobs can be generated and uh, health will be protected. So I think it's a very critical moment to, to make sure that we link those messages, protecting health, access to, to, to uh, uh, modern and sustainable sources of energy are critically linked and will represent a very good protection for your health. And the last one, please, we give you um, the information about where we are in terms of uh, which re regions are, are getting more uh, uh, improvements. And uh, in terms of access in Eastern, Southeastern, Central and Southern Asia, there are good news. They are, there are, uh, we've seen an, a decrease in the population without access. While we saw in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, the population without access is increasing. Not because the, the real number has uh, not improved, but because of the population growth that makes uh, still a big proportion of the population without access. Uh, and that's a major issue for which we need a particular uh, policy effort and, and, and a, an investment effort and a stimulus package well addressed might, might be able to provide very good results in terms of health and economic and social benefits as well. So serious and urgent policy efforts are very much needed in sub-Saharan Africa and um, uh, aligning as well with the need for this epidemic preparedness and response that uh, very much coincide. And uh, the last one is just to I think this is the last one, just to, to, to stress again that the fact that um, not only we need a, a, a renewable, uh, sustainable, clean energy, modern energy, I think we need as well a positive energy at the moment we are living. And I think this is a positive uh, mission. This is a positive cause. This will benefit enormously our health and will contribute to this social and economic recovery that we all needed. Thank you very much. 
much, uh, Maria, for this sort of thorough, uh, thorough walk through. Now, next, uh, next on the, our list of, of speakers and experts is uh, Rapia Feruki, uh, who is uh, head of or director of, of knowledge, uh, uh, policy, and finance at uh, at uh, Irina. Uh, Rapia, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Martin. Thank you to our host and thank you to our co custodians of the Energy Progress Report for a really great collaboration this year. Uh, regarding renewable energy sources, we have witnessed uh, unprecedented developments over the last decade. And as just presented, there playing a, a key role in achieving SDG 7 targets on access. The, the business case for both off-grid and on-grid renewables keeps really getting stronger and the continuing cost <laughs> in new solar and wind projects is under, really undercutting the, the, the cheapest existing power plant, for example. Uh, the the, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, not yet uh, shown its full uh, impact on renewables. But so far, the um, uh, energy, renewable energy uh, has proven to be the energy source somewhat more resilient to the crisis. Uh, next slide. So looking at the specific indicator of SDG 7.2, uh, our report findings show that globally renewables accounted for 17.3% of total final energy consumption in 2017. This is uh, up from 16.6% in 2010. Although modest, this increase in share uh, indicates that uh, renewables are growing faster than overall energy consumption, which is a trend that we have been seeing since uh, 2011. Now, uh, modern uh, renewable energy, uh, meaning uh, excluding traditional use of biomass, pushes this growth, in particular in the electricity sector, where com consumption hit a, a record in 2016. There was a slight uh, slowdown in 2017, mainly because of lower output of hydropower. However, it's important to note that renewables in heat and transportation are falling far behind their potential. Um, so despite the impressive uptake in renewables, we are far from... We are far from... I think there's some, some, some uh, microphones yeah. that help me. Thank you. So, uh, just to repeat that, we, we also need to note that renewables in heat and transport sectors are falling far behind their potential. Uh, and despite the impressive uptake in renewables, we are far from what is needed to reach the global target by, by 2030. Uh, presented in our report uh, showed that the share of modern renewable energy needs to reach up to 28% by 2030 to be in line with global climate objectives. So to reach uh, uh, global climate goals uh, and therefore uh, accelerating the uptake of renewables will be challenging and it will require significant investment. Not only is this achievable, but we have solid evidence now that it would bring significant socioeconomic benefits if appropriate and holistic enabling frameworks are put in place. Such frameworks, of course, include deployment policies such as uh, options, which uh, schemes, which are highlighted in our report, but they also require fiscal, industrial, labor, social policies that can ensure a just transition. This means that systemic changes are required uh, 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 unquestionably uh, as part of the way forward. The COVID-19 pandemic has unveiled the profound uh, differences in countries' ability to respond to the crisis. And uh, I think that now more than ever, enhanced cooperation, solidarity, and support to those most in need uh, are urgently required. Um, in this context, and for the first time in this year's report, we track SDG 7 
0.8.1, which measures international public financial flows to developing countries in support of clean and renewable energy development. The findings uh, show that, that public financial flows have doubled since 2010. They reached about 20.1 billion US dollars in 2017. So this is a, develop, a development that is quite encouraging, but the indicator also reveals great disparity on the receiving end, uh, and only 12% of international financial flows reach the least developed countries, and most of which are in sub-Saharan Africa. So decision makers now have an opportunity to raise the ambition of the energy transition plans, strengthen the role of renewables in international support programs, and really ensure that no one is left behind. I think we, uh, uh, we must keep in mind that there is a lot more than megawatts to gain from substantially increasing or accelerating the growth in renewable energy. We have solid evidence that a shift towards higher share of renewables and energy efficiency is going to generate much needed new jobs, uh, GDP growth, and overall welfare gains that are worth three to eight times more than the investments that are required for the energy transition. So thank you for your attention. And with this, I will now hand over, I think, to David Sirk from the IEA. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Ravi. This is about so much more than megawatts. Dave, Sirk, IEA, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin, and thanks for all Denmark's leadership, uh, including on the energy transitions track for last year's uh, climate summit, which seems like about 10 years ago because of the COVID crisis and everything else going on, but was not that long ago. So much appreciated your personal leadership, Martin, uh, as well as the leadership of Ethiopia and all the other countries involved. Uh, the IA is honored to be uh, part of this group, very uh, esteemed group. Uh, working uh, as custodians of SDG 7, the World Bank, ARENA, WHO, UNSD. And uh, thank you in particular to our uh, IRENA colleagues for coordinating the report this year and sharing. So much appreciated on all that front. Uh, I'm going to talk about energy efficiency. Let's go ahead and uh, switch over to the substantive slide on efficiency. Uh, and then I'll also talk about outlooks uh, very quickly uh, as well. So um, if someone could switch over, there we go, perfect. Uh, so uh, energy efficiency, uh, certainly the way we talk about it is really is the first fuel. Uh, and it really is central, uh, absolutely central and critical uh, to uh, all global energy transitions from around the world. And this certainly is recognized, as everyone knows, in SDG 7, 7.3 in particular, with the goal of doubling the historic rate of improvement uh, between 2010 and 2030. So how are we doing uh, to achieve that doubling? Well, as you can see, between 1990 and 2010, uh, we were averaging about a 1.3% uh, rate of improvement. Um, doubling that would be 2.6%. Uh, as we look at the first part of the decade, uh, we've seen a gradual rise. Uh, you see the 2.1% from 2011 to 2014. 2015 was the high water mark uh, for efficiency with a 3%, which is over the doubling uh, target, so quite a good year there. Um, unfortunately, though, uh, we're not reaching overall that 2.6 uh, target. In fact, uh, as you see the progress or relative lack of progress in 2016 and then 2017, where we went back down to 1.7 percent. Because we've not achieved that 2.6 percent target each year, we actually need to do more. You see that yellow uh, bar there with the additional progress. So we actually need to achieve around 3 percent from here on out in order to achieve SDG 7 when it comes uh, to efficiency. Now, a bit of even worse news is if you look at the 2018 numbers there at the very end of the bar graph in front of you, and the 2019 numbers uh, were nowhere near that 3%, let alone the 2.6%, we're at 1.3% and then 2% uh, respectively, uh, respectively as well. Uh, we also have some challenges, uh, as everything seems to have challenges, as part of the COVID, uh, COVID crisis as well. And uh, what we actually see in our World Energy Investment Report, which came out just last week, looking at investment across the energy space, was a 10% reduction in efficiency investment uh, for this year that we're predicting. 
So that are, those are projects that aren't going to be done and that will certainly have an impact, uh, impact as well. Now before we leave efficiency, let me give you uh, two good pieces of news on the efficiency front. Um, one, there's global commitment and global action on this. I mentioned at the outset and thanked Martin for Denmark and Ethiopia's leader in the energy transitions track. Uh, one collaboration uh, that was launched there is the 3% Club that many of the organizations who are part of the SDG custodians are also leading parts of that as well. And the goal there is to join forces, 15 countries having agreed to do so, to try to achieve that 3% target year in and year out globally and to try to help and support each other in order, uh, in order to do that. So there is commitment, there is international commitment, we just need to take advantage and fully realize the opportunities on efficiency. With regard to that, the other good piece of news is as countries around the world and others helping them, IMF, World Bank, uh, many on this call here today, are spending trillions uh, of dollars, euros, whatever currency, on packages, efficiency makes a phenomenal uh, opportunity to not only have jobs, not only have economic recovery, uh, but to really achieve our sustainable objective, uh, sustainable development objectives, and certainly SDG 7.3 as well. So the stimulus packages, especially when you're thinking about jobs, which is the imperative economic recovery, that's the imperative. The efficiency piece is incredibly strong. Uh, very good arguments uh, on that front. So let's switch over to the other part of my part of the presentation, which is focused uh, on outlooks. Uh, this is really trying to use our uh, tools and techniques to look ahead. Uh, several colleagues already looked ahead about where we would be. Um, what I'm going to refer to in this slide is uh, two basic scenarios. Scenarios aren't predictions of where the uh, world is definitely headed necessarily. It's just uh, exploring where the world could be in this instance by 2030 under a different set of assumptions. So one scenario is looking under existing levels of ambition, current and planned policies. Where does that take us to achieve our SDG 7 objectives? And then another scenario looks at how we actually can achieve those objectives. How much would it cost? Uh, what does that look like? Where are the opportunities going forward? So very quickly, just run, uh, run through each of these. First on access uh, to electricity. First thing to point out, um, and certainly dovetailing with Rohit's presentation, is we do have well-designed policies implemented in many countries around the world. We have good case studies, Asia, many Asian countries, countries such as Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Rwanda, Senegal, South Africa, all firmly on course to achieve, uh, to achieve the universal access to electricity goal in SDG 7. So we've got examples that can be learned uh, from, from other countries. Nonetheless, overall, as Rohit pointed out, we're not on track to achieve universal electricity access. 620 million people uh, without access to electricity by 2030, 85% of them uh, unfortunately located in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, one good news as we look at our modeling uh, results is really the uh, power and potential of decentralized uh, solutions. Uh, when we do our modeling looking at how we can achieve universal electricity access, a full half of the least cost uh, solutions to providing access to achieve our SDG 7 goals come from those decentralized uh, solutions. So there's a lot of opportunity in many uh, countries around the world, including with decentralized solutions when it comes to access to electricity. On clean cooking uh, access, uh, unfortunately, if the priority uh, remains uh, where it currently is on clean cooking, we're gonna have about 2.3 billion people still by 2030 dependent on traditional uses of biomass, kerosene, or coal uh, for cooking. Uh, as Maria pointed out, this is a huge, huge health uh, impact, uh, all sorts of other detriments uh, as well uh, along those lines. Um, what we need to do is raise the profile. Unfortunately, the current global health and economic crisis threatens to slow progress uh, even further. But again, we've got good case studies, good examples from key countries around the world making very significant progress. Ethiopia, Ghana, India, just to name a few examples. We need to learn from these countries. We need to export, we need support, and we need leadership from many, many countries around the world to um, really take advantage of these huge opportunities for more clean cooking access. Renewable energy. Um, when we do our modeling and looking what we can achieve in a relatively short amount of time by 2030, the potential is huge, both the IA modeling and then the IRENA modeling as well. 
In particular, renewables could climb to around 50% or more of electricity generation in that SDG uh, time period. Again, COVID is having some challenges. Rabia mentioned uh, it's great to see renewables as the most resilient fuel of all, uh, which came through in our own analysis as well. But as we look at 2020 uh, for a variety of challenges, uh, uh, renewables uh, capacity additions declining by 13%. Now, much of that may be picked up in the following year, but more and more efforts need to uh, ensure that renewables uh, are scaling up as quickly as they possibly uh, can to achieve the SDG uh, goal. We also need to think about renewables outside of the electricity space as well, or in heating. And there, uh, we're not seeing as much resilience uh, for uh, biofuels, as much resilience for uh, renewable heating uh, as we're seeing it in the electricity sector. So more work there uh, in particular. Now the outlook on energy efficiency, as we look ahead again under current planned existing levels of ambition, we do increase our energy efficiency uh, percentage. It's about a 2.3% annual uh, efficiency improvement from 2017 to 2030. Now again, that's much below the 3% uh, required to meet the SDG 7.3 target. Uh, the good news there is when we do our modeling here, uh, our sustainable development scenario in particular to achieve our climate goals, achieve uh, access uh, and reduce air pollution, we actually see that a 3.6% annual, an annual rate of improvement is not only very possible, but can be using existing technologies with good returns on investment as well. So the opportunity space on efficiency is huge. Building sector in particular is one to point out where 40% of the needed savings in energy demand by 2030 can be found just uh, in the buildings sector. Uh, last outlook to highlight is really on the investments in the fuel savings side. When we look at what's necessary from an investment standpoint to get us to that sustainable development scenario, to get us to achieve the sustainable development goals, we find that we need around 45 billion annually for energy access 625 billion each year for energy efficiency and 680 billion by 2030. Those may sound like big numbers, uh, but if you look at it in the broader context of investment, uh, they are not huge numbers and they're very uh, achievable numbers uh, uh, as well. Just let me conclude with one last word on the COVID-19 crisis uh, in particular. Obviously huge challenges, health challenges, economic challenges, job challenges, uh, around the world uh, uh, that we're seeing, and we're tracking them, certainly those changes from the, uh, from the energy side of the equation. We do have the opportunity as countries rebuild, as countries invest, as countries recover, as countries have economic stimulus uh, packages to be smart and to build towards the energy systems uh, of the future to help achieve our sustainable development goals. We've got a big special report coming out in a couple of weeks from our World Energy Outlook colleagues looking exactly at how stimulus packages can incorporate and achieve those clean energy uh, goals and quantifying the jobs and economic recovery associated with efficiency, with renewables, and with the full range of technologies. We'll also have on the 9th of July that we very much hope all of you participate in is a clean energy transition summit. This will be our biggest, most important meeting of the IA of the year really trying to build this grand coalition for everybody to step up to the plate, do what they need to do from the government side, from the company side as well. So there is good news. The outlooks show that there's achievable goals uh, here in dealing with the SDGs. Uh, we just need to step up uh, and take advantage of those opportunities. So thank you, Martin. Back over to you. And I think uh, Stefan is next uh, to round out the custodian presentations. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dave. Also that you personally, but also IA showed in, 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 uh, in the probations for and, and, and during the Climate Action Summit. Uh, and thank you for taking us of a journey, you know, first of all, sort of, you know, a slightly depressing journey, but then sort of uplifting our experience, saying that actually it can, it can be done. And in the larger scheme of things, it's actually not that much we have to do. Now, next, uh, next is uh, Stefan uh, Schweinfest, the director of the uh, United Nations uh, Statistics Division. Now, before I give the floor to Stefan, I just want to say we are running over time. So uh, I'm I, I'm extending the meeting until uh, until uh, 11:30, so if participants are able to hang on to to uh, to 11:30, then we will actually have a chance for Q&A. But that does require uh, the four remaining speakers to, uh, to 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 stick with the uh, allotted time. So uh, Stefan, with that, over to you. 
Yes, good morning, uh, um, everybody, and thank you, Ambassador Herman, for this opportunity. And I can uh, assure you, I will be brief as the last speaker. I will not repeat anything of the great things that have already been done. Uh, basically, I only have two messages. One is a message of thanks uh, because uh, to everybody involved, because I think this is really an excellent example of how we work together with the custodian agencies and beyond. I mean, here you've seen that the data people, the statisticians, the analysts and the users, the politicians have worked very closely together to produce this report. And it's been representatives and experts from countries and from international agencies from the UN and beyond the UN. So for me, it's really actually a great pleasure and we do have the, the political support through uh, the, the, the friends group. Uh, so I think this is really a fantastic example. Uh, and as a director of statistics, I'm responsible for many areas. So energy statistics is, of course, only one of them. Uh, but I can assure you that this is really um, uh, an excellent example of how the cooperation should go. And I wanted to thank everybody involved. And uh, one small but important example, of, for instance, is countries always complain that we overburden them with the data requests from the international agencies. That is not the case in energy statistics. We are very organized and we have a data agreement with uh, the uh, um, OECD countries and so that are collected uh, um, by IAEA and uh, the uh, developing countries where we focus at the United Nations and so um, I'm the data guy I will of course uh, say something a little bit about data we have heard many challenges about the current situation but I'm a hopeless optimist and I see opportunities even in the middle of a crisis and I think this is a data moment uh, we can look at this now as a new global virtual family of the uh, the data and statisticians colleagues from around the world have actually come together and have been working very very closely together so in a way the crisis brings us perhaps even closer Closer together, the Secretary General has uh, supported uh, uh, is supporting data through his uh, data strategy that he has launched, uh, where he emphasizes that data are an asset for the United Nations. And just yesterday, uh, ECOSOC. Uh, uh, reviewed and uh, um, adopted uh, a resolution on strengthening the United Nations statistical system. So data are the lifeblood of everything we are doing. I mean, they make our SDG uh, framework and accountability framework. You saw a lot of data. And the Statistical Commission as the body that brings together the uh, chief statisticians from around the world is, of course, at the heart of this. This is how the countries uh, uh, have control of this process, and this is, of course, very important. And the SDG indicator framework was developed there. And, of course, the um, uh, indicators for goal seven are part of the overall and the wider package. And of course, one of my jobs is to keep it all together, that also the indicators and the data for this particular goal are well integrated in the broader indicator framework so that we can also uh, conduct analysis of how the issue of sustainable energy is intrinsically linked with many of the other uh, elements of the agenda. So is everything good here? Well, everything, all areas always have opportunities of improvement. And I think one thing that we may be able to improve and we should improve collectively is that uh, we do have a lot of data here in the report and you see many uh, numbers on your screen, but um, we also need to recognize that some of those data, even though all of our partners and us included, all the custodian agencies try to reach out to get the official data from countries, we all know how countries are struggling to produce their own data. So in some cases, um, the data that we have collected needs to be complemented by modeling or estimation exercises. And that's the best we can do. And it's done in a rational way and scientific way. But the ideal situation has to be at the end, our ambition and vision has to be that every country, the countries can produce their own high quality, timely, and country-owned data that are integrated uh, across the whole spectrum of the SDGs. 
So I think there is still work for us to do. We and we at uh, um, UNSD, at the Statistics Division of DESA, are highly committed to this goal. I mean, capacity building, and I know so are all our partners, the custodian agencies. And I'm looking forward uh, to producing even more, even more better and more solid data. And I always said a good data item is one that is used and that ultimately changes the minds of people to uh, get them to behave in a, in a better way, uh, changes policies uh, by informing uh, policy makers who often have to take difficult choices. And um, and one of the things that we already clearly see as uh, um, the special representative, uh, uh, Dami Lola, has already pointed out, and part of our global reports is always to point out which are the countries or the areas or geographies that are potentially left behind, and a special attention, of course, needs to be paid to Africa here. But again, our com thanks to all of our partners. Thanks to you for organizing this event. And our continued commitment uh, at UNSD DESA with all of our partners here around the table and everywhere to work and strengthen national statistical capacities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan, also for highlighting the importance of actually of, of, of collaboration on data sharing, uh, not only across countries, but actually also across, uh, across uh, agencies. Um, now we move into uh, into the second part of uh, into the second part of the, the global launch, and that is to have a sort of closer look at the, the policy briefs on on SDG seven uh, and the interlinkages with uh, with other uh, other SDGs. And 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 I'm delighted uh, that that we have uh, that we have with us the uh, the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social uh, Affairs, uh, Shemin Liu. Uh, uh, Under Secretary General Liu, are you there? Yes, Martin. Yes, you have the floor. So good to you hear me. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for moderating this, this session. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to launch the 2020 edition of the SDG policy briefs, accelerating SDG 7 in time of COVID 19. I wish to express my sincere gratitude to the co chairs of the group of friends of of sustainable energy as permanent representative of Denmark, Ethiopia, Norway, and Pakistan for their collaboration to host this year's global lunch. Please also allow me to congratulate SDG 7 indicator custodians for this year's SDG 7 energy progress report being launched today. I wish to command the leadership of Francesco, Director General of IRENA, as chair of this year's report. Ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic of COVID-19, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic has been both immediate and appalling, and represents the biggest shock to the global energy system in decades. It has caused tremendous uncertainty in our collective efforts towards SDG 7 achievement. Yet, of the long term, climate change remains the biggest threat to humanity. Should the pandemic slow the clean energy transition, it will severely jeopardize our fight against climate change. Equally important, without ensuring universal energy access, 2030 agenda will be in jeopardy since energy is strongly linked to the many SDGs. Accelerating energy decarbonization with universal access is a critical means for achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement. This is also emphasized by the Global Sustainable Development Report 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, the forthcoming high-level platform in July represents another opportunity to strengthen our commitment to the SDGs, including SDG 7. In this regard, I note its theme of accelerated action and transformative pathways, realizing the decade of action and delivery for sustainable development. I congratulate the multi-stakeholder SDG 7 technical advisory group, 
Amin Fighters lah. Successfully delivering its third edition of the SDG 7 policy briefs in support of this year's discussions at high level trade forum. I thank Mr. Sheila Faracha and, and Mr. Heinz Olaf Ibrahim, co facilitators of the group, for their effective leadership. The main message from this year's policy briefs is clear. We must step up. Although the world continues to advance towards SDG 7, its efforts are falling well short of the scale required to reach these targets by 2030. In the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, countries need to safeguard past gains and invest in even larger efforts in the, in the post pandemic world. The report highlights COVID-19 implications of SDG 7 progress and how to accelerate SDG 7 progress in these uncertain times. It also provides practical analysis on interlinkages between energy and the five other thematic topics of this year's, of this year's High Level Trade Forum. And ways to raise sustainable energy ambition through enhanced nationally determined contributions and challenges and opportunities at the regional levels, including a dedicated policy brief on advancing SDG 7 in the least developed countries. Ladies and gentlemen, together, the SDG 7 progress report and the SDG 7 policy briefs provide a strong basis for determining what needs to be done to scale up and accelerate progress on SDG 7 between now and 2030. During DESA, we continue to support the work of the SDG 7 technical advisor group. Of course, during DESA will continue to participate in the group in preparation of the SDG 7 progress report. Ladies and gentlemen, the current crisis is an unprecedented wake up call. We need to turn the recovery efforts into the opportunity to build back better. SDG 7 is the key to this global vision. As mandated by the General Assembly Resolution 74 stroke 225, a high level dialogue on energy will be convened by the Secretary General in 2021 to promote the implementation of the energy related flow goals and targets of the 2030 agenda and the auspices of the General Assembly. As the Dialogue Secretary General, I look forward to working closely with the Member States and all other stakeholders leading up to this dialogue in 2021. I wish today's global lunch a great success. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much, Under Secretary General, and, and for emphasizing uh, once again that we cannot allow COVID-19 to slow uh, to slow our, our ambitions and to slow progress. In fact, we need to accelerate that if we are to deliver on Paris and if we are to deliver on Agenda 2030. And as you said, we must step up uh, and, and, and thanks for highlighting also the importance of uh, the high level political forum and, and, and the perfect timing to some extent of the SDC 7 tracking report, allowing us to form policies and discuss policies based on science and, and data. Now, without much further uh, ado, I, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Hans Olaf uh, Ibrek, Policy Director, Energy and Climate Change in the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And as uh, the Under Secretary General mentioned, one of the two co facilitators of the, the policy uh, brief. So, uh, Hans Olaf, over to you. Thank you, Ambassador, for introducing us. Um, as co facilitator, uh, Sheila and I, we are really pleased to build on the remarks just made by the Under Secretary General to present this year's uh, policy briefs uh, to you. At the start of the decade of action, the SDG Technical Advisory Group still believed that, that SDG 7 is within reach, but only if we all make the right decisions, enhance our ambitions, and take immediate action to scale up our efforts. We are at a possible turning point that has been mentioned by many today. Decisions we take in the coming months will seriously impact our ability to reach SDG 7. 
The COVID-19 pandemic can either widen the existing sustainable energy access gaps or accelerate the path towards achieving SDG 7. That depends on the priorities of national recovery efforts. The choice is ours. Let me move straight into presenting the overarching key messages from the SDG 7 tag this year, because we we are short on time and in the interest of allowing member states to add uh, their views on this. First, we must maintain global momentum to accelerate a shift towards decarbonized, climate resilient energy systems and universal energy access. Failure to transition quickly to more accessible, affordable and sustainable energy systems will reinforce weaknesses in our energy systems as demonstrated by COVID-19. It will also jeopardize the fight against climate change and threaten human well-being, ecosystems and economies for centuries. Therefore, we need political leadership, determination and unity against climate change, even as we mobilize against the pandemic. Second, although the world continues to make pro progress on SDG 7, our all efforts are falling well short of the scale required and our custodians have really highlighted this, this to us. Efforts must be intensified, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Urgent action will be required to expand electricity access to health facilities, and we need major initiatives, political prioritization, and substantial investments in order to achieve universal access to clean cooking. Energy efficiency <coughs> made a policy and investment priority. Current costly energy practices in humanitarian assistance will need to be changed to deliver sustainable energy solutions to refugees. We need to integrate gender equality and women's empowerment into all energy actions to advance the SDGs. Third, far more needs to be done to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 in pursuit of the one and a half degree goal. Current ambition levels related to renewable energy and energy efficiency do not match the efforts needed for meeting the mitigation targets set out in the Paris Agreement. Countries need to set more ambitious targets and policies in their revised indices. There is an urgent need to support the phase out of coal through clean energy plans and remove inefficient fossil fuel subsidies supported by just transition strategies. Building interconnected energy system, systems will also accelerate energy sector decarbonization. Fourth, as has been highlighted by many of the, of the previous speakers, post-COVID-19 recovery strategies present opportunities for economies to become greener and more resilient while working towards SDG 7 targets. My colleague Sheila will provide more uh, policy recommendations on this issue. Fifth, we call on all member states and other stakeholders to drive the global energy transformation forward by forming multi-stakeholder transformational partnerships. In dealing with the pandemic, strong political commitments by governments and multilateral cooperation will be more crucial than ever to maintain the momentum for SDG 7. UN entities, international organizations, and multilateral development banks, as well as businesses, civil society, and other stakeholders must step up and strengthen their efforts to support the implementation of the SDGs. And we need to include youth in all our efforts. Now I'll leave the floor to Sheila to provide some additional remarks on behalf of us co-facilitators. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sheila, directly over to you. Thank you, Hans. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic is spreading human suffering, destabilizing the global economy and upending the lives of billions of people in an unprecedented way. While COVID is the most urgent threat facing humanity today, poverty and climate change remain greater threats in the long term. We must not lose sight of these overwhelming challenges in our current responses to the pandemic. Even before this pandemic, the world was not on track to achieve most of the sustainable development goals, as the SDG 7 custodians told us today. As we address the current crisis, the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement must remain at the center of our efforts to recover so that we move forward in a better and greener way, leaving no one behind. Governments that integrate their responses to COVID-19 
Together with the SDG targets and long range efforts to combat climate change, we'll create more resilient societies with stronger health systems, fewer people living in extreme poverty, more gender equality, and a healthier natural environment. Sustainable energy should play a central role in countries' efforts to recover from the COVID-19 crisis in ways that make them better and stronger. Energy services are essential for fighting the pandemic, including for powering healthcare facilities and keeping medicines cold, supplying clean water for hand washing, providing communication services to connect people, share information, and facilitate education during social distancing. Expanding these services through increased investments in sustainable energy solutions will enable countries to respond to the pandemic while also creating significant clean jobs, green jobs, empowering women, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and advancing other sustainable development goals. Ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic can either widen the existing sustainable energy access gaps or accelerate the pathway towards achieving SDG 7 depending on the priorities of national recovery efforts. The SDG 7 Technical Advisory Group is pleased to offer a set of recommendations that may help government's responses to become better and stronger while advancing the SDGs and putting the world on a 1.5 degree Celsius pathways. Let me briefly highlight some of these. First, integrate sustainable energy solutions in COVID-19 responses and recovery strategies to help economies become greener and more resilient based on the SDG 7 targets. Second, use the enhanced NDCs as a framework for green investments in economic recovery packages. Third, prioritize modern energy services that will also save lives, powered by a mixture of on and off grid and clean cooking solutions. Four, invest in renewables and energy efficiencies to create green jobs. Fifth, phase out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Six, adopt just transitions to support the phase out of coal through clean energy plans and targets. Seven, support vulnerable groups of people to leave no one behind and promote a more gender equal response and recovery. And finally, strengthen international cooperation and multilateralism. We are very grateful to all the technical advisory group members and to the SDG 7 custodians for their hard work. We are proud of the active engagement in our work by colleagues from a number of organizations, as can be seen on the slide. Please move to the next slide. This collaborative work, combined with the diverse operational experience, expertise and viewpoints of everyone involved, provides a model for strengthened coordination and coherence within and beyond the UN development system. We also wish to acknowledge the leadership provided by Under Secretary General Liu and the dedicated UNDESA team that has supported our efforts. We sincerely hope that member states and all stakeholders, including international organizations, multilateral banks, businesses, and civil society groups, will find the analysis and recommendations useful as they review and renew their commitments to achieving the SDGs. The time to act is now. We are counting on everyone to work together to make the achievement of SDG 7 a reality. Thank you all for your attention and particular thanks to the group of friends of Sustainable Energy for hosting this event. Thank you so much, uh, Sheila, for this uh, quick overview. Now, we now move into uh, sort of the extended half hour, sort of extended time of, of, uh, of, of this, what was originally anticipated to be a two hour uh, event. Now, it says on, on my sheet that it should be an interactive discussion. It's not going to be uh, because we already have a list of 10 speakers and that's, that's the end of the list. Now, but fortunately now I'm in familiar territory because I'm now with colleagues who know that I can be very, very tough and I will cut them off after after three minutes. Uh, so colleagues, you don't have to say that you're happy uh, to be here, that you think the, import, uh, the event is important, that sustainable energy uh, is important, and you don't have to thank me or any of the other uh, co-chairs uh, for, for what we are, are doing. Um, so three minutes each, and then we should be able to keep it within uh, within half an hour. Now, we first uh, move back to actually to Abu Dhabi, to uh, the permanent representative, to Irina uh, Nawal al uh, uh, if if, uh, if if they're still with us in Abu Dhabi. Nawal, are you with us? Yes, I, yes. hello. Thank you very much, dear Your Excellency, ministers and distinguished guests and colleagues. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you. 
Uh, on behalf of the UAE, I would like to extend our congratulations for producing such a comprehensive and insightful report on the progress of the seventh sustainability development goal uh, on, on affordable and clean energy. The report shows how far we have already come in the last decade alone, and I'm especially pleased to see a focus on the impact that the energy sector has on human health. Uh, this is really important topic that the UAE's mission to the UN along with the Ministry of Climate Change uh, and Environment worked very closely uh, with the World Health uh, Organization to ensure it was central theme to the Climate Action Summit preparatory meeting held uh, here in Abu Dhabi last year. However, as a couple of our colleagues uh, highlighted, the reports also shows how far we have uh, left to go, including some major gaps that we must plug and soon uh, and to be able to achieve our targets. Um, one billion more people have access to electricity today than they did in 2010. This is very encouraging development and it should only motivate us further to make sure the remaining 789 million people who still don't have access get it very soon. However, a real concern highlighted by the report and a couple of, uh, of the colleagues spoke before me uh, is the high number of people without access to clean uh, cooking solutions over the last two decades. The report states that you know, the 2.8 billion people still cook by burning polluting methods. We should make it a priority to improve access to technologies that can improve uh, people's life and benefit the environment at the same time. Meanwhile, we are also very encouraged to see from the report that the share of renewables in the global energy mix has reached 17.3% uh, in 2017 which is going to be vital if we are to avoid the path to a dangerous three degrees Celsius global warming. While I agree with everybody, COVID-19 has uh, undoubtedly had a very real and major impact on economic activity, the commitments to including renewable energy solutions and stimulus packages moving forward remains uh, a priority here in the UAE. We are continuously working to make the energy transition as seamless as possible. COVID-19 has not inhibited our commitment to that cause. Just a month ago, Abu Dhabi announced the world's lowest solar prices in the latest auction on uh, Al Dafra Solar PV project. The agreed price is as low as 1.35 US cent per kilowatt hour. I'm also very proud to announce that Dubai just achieved a 9% share of renewable energy in their total energy mix. With this, Dubai is overachieving on their set target of 7% for 2020. With a comprehensive demand side management strategy, we are currently also looking into an increased energy efficiency in both the energy and the water sector. Ladies and gentlemen, this context gives us great confidence that we are on the right track. Thank you for your time, and I wish everyone and their families good health in this time of crisis. Thank you for the time, Marcy. Thank you so much, uh, Nawal al uh, Also, for demonstrating actually that it is possible for permanent purposes to keep to uh, to keep to the allotted uh, allotted time. Uh, now, uh, now the next uh, the next uh, speaker on my list is my very good friend and colleague, uh, the chair of the. Uh, Association of Small Island uh, States. Uh, Louis, uh, you have uh, three minutes, and then after that, uh, Omar from uh, Morocco. Louis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, as the, the chair of AOSIS, I want to thank the group of Friends of Sustainable Energy for organizing this meeting. And I knew we sh and you said we shouldn't say thank you, but I still want to thank IRENA, the IEA, the UN Statistics Division, World Bank, and WHO in the preparation of this annual report. I also want to ex uh, appreciate, um, express appreciation to all stakeholders who contributed to the preparation of the policy briefs. And the policy briefs may be a useful tool for the high-level political forum and, and in guiding the global economic restructuring we are now all undertaking. In the interest of time, I will make four brief points, uh, Martin, colleagues. The uh, COVID-19 has highlighted the need for enhanced for enhancing resilience across all sectors. Transition to renewable energy provides a sustainable solution to strengthen a number of sectors, including electricity generation, healthcare, and transport, while moving away from price volatile fossil fuels 
and other inefficient traditional forms of energy. That's point number one. Point number two, the economic responses to COVID-19 and especially the stimulus packages provide us with a unique opportunity to scale up deployment of renewable energy. This has been said by every single speaker, I think, this morning, every single presenter. In addition to diversifying and boosting the economy, they also progress the sustainable development goals and our climate change commitments. Three, going forward, our actions must not be short-sighted or aim for the low-hanging fruit. We must align our NDCs and long-term emission reduction strategies with the sustainable development goals and tailor the COVID responses to contribute to those long-term objectives. This would facilitate the larger scale investments required for energy transition, supplemented through resources allocated for response and recovery. Fourthly, last, it, it, it's not the least point, but it's number four, we need scaled up new and additional support accompanied with the necessary capacity building to formulate and operationalize these plans. Many countries lack the data and capacity to analyze the feasibility of such strategies. And this lacuna results in more conservative approaches. At the same time, ambitious plans can only be translated into actions if the gaps in finances as well as the issues of access are urgently resolved. Um, may I conclude by assuring you that SIDS remain fully committed to realizing our ambitious renewable targets by 2030. And we will continue to work with IRENA, UNDP, and UNDESA, and other development partners to ensure that we do not lose all our momentum despite the compounding challenges that we face. And thank you very much for listening to me and thank you very much for the excellent presentations. Thank you, Lois. Spot on, time-wise, message-wise. Uh, now over to uh, my good friend, uh, Omar Ilale, uh, PR of Morocco. Omar, Morocco is a leader in this and so are you. Thank you very much, my dear Martin. I'm following your advisors. I will start directly. The Energy Progress Report shows that the world economies are shifting at many levels prior to the start, start of the COVID-19 crisis. Significant progress had been made on various aspects of SDG 7 for uh, affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy, which led to a notable reduction in the number of people lacking access to electricity. However, the journey is still long in order to reach all the countries in need for energy. Morocco is convinced that the strong uptake of renewable energy for electricity generation and improvement in energy efficiency is gaining ground internationally. This is why we need to keep our effort in order to maintain this progress and avoid falling short of ensuring universal access to renewable and modern energy by 2030 to committee communities around the world. In this vein, the COVID-19 crisis is both an opportunity and a challenge to energy grid expansion. In Africa, regional and global efforts continue to seize this opportunity at a time when the response to COVID-19 intensifies the urgency to expand sustainable energy solution to the least developed country. The study shows that more efforts are needed in Africa to be energy self-efficient. As we continue our common effort for the full implementation SDGs, we should take out message from the following re report. One, global, regional, and country-level data help us take informed decisions, informed decisions, and identify in better way priorities in the field of energy cooperation, scaling up affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy should be part of the overall recovery from the COVID-19. And finally, we should to give a particular importance to concrete actions where various stakeholders intervene in the field of renewable and regional and global levels. The findings of this report are clear signal that our future lies in diversifying sources of energy with the full and effective application of public and private stakeholders. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you so much, uh, Omar, uh, for, as always, a very, very lucid and clear uh, presentation, also forcing us to think about the concrete steps that are uh, needed and what actually the policy briefs and the report uh, tells us. We count on your continued leadership uh, also in this uh, field. It's now my pleasure to give the floor to another good friend and colleague, uh, uh, Kairat uh, Umarov, uh, the PR of, uh, of Kazakhstan. Kairat, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yeah. Good. Three minutes. Okay. Let me thank uh, the co-chairs of course, Denmark, Ethiopia, Norway, and Pakistan for convening this important event. I'm uh, grateful to the panelists for their very thoughtful presentations. We're going to follow them and uh, send this uh, recent edition of Energy Progress Report to the respective ministers, uh, mi ministries, and of course, what we've discussed today. We are glad that the positive trends of increases in global number of people with access to electricity, share of renewables, international financial flows to developing countries for clean energy and other indicators show significant progress during the past years. However, the ongoing pandemic and its negative global aftermath may definitely turn the tide. Under such negative shocks, it is important to scale up our efforts and sustainable investments or in on-time realization of SDGs, and especially SG, uh, SDG 7 in developing countries, as well as keeping up our international climate effort. Let us be realistic. Without access to energy, it is difficult to speak about sustainable development in broader sense in vulnerable countries, uh, leaving aside transfer of technology or innovations, infrastructural projects, or dig digitalization. Lack of political will or resources to use clean technology negatively impacts the climate. So negative uh, climate changes have severely affected Kazakhstan and the whole Central Asia. This forces us to search for alternative energy sources. Currently, Kazakhstan is aiming to increase the share of renewable sources to 10% of the total energy balance by 2030 and to 50% by 2050. Today, there, today uh, there are already 97 operating renewable energy facilities in Kazakhstan with over half of the renewable power generated by solar power plants and another force from the wind farms. What are the ways to resolve the issue? Um, let me just uh, say that in Kazakhstan in February, uh, we added renewable energy industry to the list of priority investment projects. This reform will allow investors to receive a huge tax breaks and benefits as part of the investment deal. Uh, in 2019-21, renewable projects attracted 613 million in investments in our country, and Central Asia uh, today is, uh, and we have today uh, the largest solar plant uh, in Central Asia, uh, which was helped us to be built by German developers developers. Um, being the chair of the group of landlocked developing countries, I would like to underline that this issue remains a challenge in many LLDCs, as the average proportion of people with access to electricity uh, in LLDCs was about 61% in 2017, compared to the world average of 87%. There is need to support the efforts of the LLDCs to develop renewable energy sources, through providing technical assistance and capacity building. Uh, to conclude, Kazakhstan firmly believes that if climate change knows no borders, there is no, uh, uh, then our answer to it also must uh, not know any borders. Only joint actions will, with the support of the world community, UN and other relevant institutions will undoubtedly have a positive impact on our way to ensure access to affordable reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. I thank you. Thank you so much, Kyra, also for emphasizing what is uh, obvious, but not sometimes always practiced, the, fact, the simple fact that we are together in this, and this is a challenge that we can solve, but only if we do so together. Now, the next speaker on my list is, uh, is, a very, is another good colleague from the Russian Federation, uh, DPR, uh, Dmitry uh, Chumakov. Dmitry, are you there? Then switch on your camera and turn on your mic. You have three minutes. Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Uh, thank you, organizers, panelists. Uh, great to see you all. Uh, ensuring universal and stable access to energy remains, uh, of course, one of the major challenges, and of course, in the context of COVID-19. 
uh, and its impact is yet to be calculated. But it's important not to leave any country behind when it comes to electricity that is crucial for healthcare services and speedy economic recovery. We had um, uh, very important statistics today in that regard. Uh, so efforts to combat climate change should not be a defining issue for the pace of expansion of energy access. Both goals are critical for sustainable development. In order to be effective, an international cooperation on energy should be open and free from discriminatory measures, including unilateral economic sanctions. We thank all partners for preparing and presenting the progress report. A lot of data is uh, presented. It will help us to understand the current state of play. Nevertheless, we also want to highlight the attempt to track uh, uh, SDG 7 that contains different targets and we highlight targets 7A and 7B on clean energy research and technology, particularly regarding advanced and cleaner fossil fuel technology and infrastructure in countries in special situation. To sum it up, I also would like to uh, welcome our panelists and my friends from Norway who uh, highlighted the term net zero emissions instead of net zero carbon. It is a very important uh, to follow what the Paris Agreement is talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Only on time, but actually ahead of uh, time, and uh, and thus giving uh, giving uh, uh, a little bit more space to to uh, colleagues, colleagues following you. Next, I give the floor to a very good uh, friend and colleague, uh, DPR of France, and you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Still only three minutes. Thank you very much, Martin. Achieving SDG seven is is of course one of the key factors in the recover better uh, strategy, and the recovery should should be an opportunity to promote energy transition, which remains one of the of France's high level priorities in spite of the current uh, crisis we're all facing in the context of the of the COVID pandemic. Um, at the end of, la uh, of April, during the Petersburg dialogue, uh, our state minister for ecological transition, Brune Poisson, presented France's view uh, of the recovery phase, and she insisted on the importance of a just transition to make our societies more sober, more sustainable, fairer, more caring and more resilient. And she stressed that we need to invest in sectors that are profitable for the economy, for jobs and for climate altogether, such um, as renewable energy. And she indicated that we must seize opportunities in uh, this post-crisis phase to achieve our long-term goals with decarbonization of the global economy at the forefront. And um, the, the energy progress report uh, of this year, which has been just launched, highlights that, that France, my country, among other countries, uh, has achieved significant growth in renewables, mostly in the, in the power sector. And the good news is that this trend will continue as we will implement the updated French strategy for energy and climate, which was uh, published in April. France has several ambitious goals in the energy sectors, uh, such as achieving carbon neutrality by 2050 and diversifying the electrical mix in order to reduce the share of nuclear power to 50% in 2035 and to increase the share of renewable energies to 33% to a third of uh, the energy uh, by 2030. So, I will conclude by highlighting the importance of the interlinkages between SDG 7 and other SDGs, in particular SDG 11 uh, on sustainable cities and SDG 13 on climate action. And uh, wanted to draw your attention to the launch uh, a few days ago on the 28th of May uh, by several actors um, of the initiative called Fast Infra. Uh, this was under the auspices of one Planet Lab uh, with the support of, of, of France and, um, and the aim of, of Fast Infra is to scale up the financing of sustainable infrastructure in developing countries. And this is directly connected, of course, to sustainable energy and shows the key role of partnerships between public and private sectors. And France uh, also works with the private sector in the context of uh, the One Planet Summits, uh, as, as you know. And 
I would also like to insist uh, on another area which is uh, of uh, priority uh, for France, which is the continuation of the cooperation on sustainable energy sources such as solar energy, uh, which we think can contribute to the fight against uh, climate change greatly. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are part of the uh, Global Solar uh, Alliance. And uh, we look forward to the, to the high-level dialogue on energy, which will be convened by uh, the Secretary General next year, and uh, which will um, be, uh, uh, you know, together with COP26, uh, um, an important milestone uh, for the progress uh, on SDG7 um, during the, the coming year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne, and for the leadership France is showing not only in forging the Paris Agreement, but actually following up and making sure that, that we move towards implementing and emphasizing that we need to move on several fronts. And, and you're absolutely right. 2021 is, is going to be a momentous year and that we spend all of 2020 preparing for this, actually building the momentum, which is needed. Now, next on my speaker's list, and, and remember, uh, three minutes only, is, uh, is Egypt uh, Sec Secretary uh, Ahmed uh, Elmas. Are you there, Ahmed? You have you hear me? Yeah, okay. Three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Mind uh, mindful of the time limitation and the old protocol observed, allow me to go directly to, to the point. Egypt share a firm belief of the importance of SDG 7. My country adopted an ambitious plan to diversify our power pool in order to keep up with our commitment under the Paris Agreement, as well as better supply our people and region with electricity. As culmination of this plan, Egypt hosts today the largest solar park in the world, Bim Bam Park, with a capacity of 1.8 thousand megawatts. Indeed, universal access to electricity is fundamental, but it could not be achieved on the expense of human basic need of access to water, as reflected in the international law and SDG 6. Regarding the previous mentioning of the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, I have to reflect my country's well-known position on this issue. An agreement between the three Liberian countries should be in place to ensure that the project operates in a mutually beneficial manner. In the same vein, I want to highlight that there is no agreement within the regional East African power pool on plans that contain disputed projects. Finally, Egypt remains firmly committed to the joint benefit of all Nile Basin family and a win-win approach in the way forward. I thank you, sir. Thank you, Ahmed. That was admirably, uh, admirably short and, and to the point. Now, next uh, on my list is another very good friend and, and colleague, uh, Ambassador uh, Jan Kikert of, uh, of Austria, which of course also is the home, if you like, of sustainable energy for all. Uh, Jan, are you there? Asking Joseph the conference. Yes, uh, we had access to his microphone. Now we don't for some reason. Um, he has some connection issues. Um, we'll see if we can get him before the meeting ends. Thank okay. you. Then we will move on. Uh, we will keep Jan for the for, for sort of the, the final cherry, uh, and then we move on to Turkey. Uh, Second Secretary uh, uh, Damla Fidan. Damla, are you there? Um, yes. Very good. You have the floor. Three minutes. Yes, Ambassador. Ambassador, thank you very much. Um, it's and uh, good morning, colleagues. It's really hard to start without a thank. So just want to uh, thank all the panelists and co-chairs of the group. Um, as you know, Turkey was one of the co-chairs of the city's track last year, and um, during our preparations, we focused on strengthening the role of cities in implementing SDG seven projects especially in um, in access to finance and creating enabling environments. And um, in this context, we believe that the narrative of the UN around energy um, should shift uh, maybe towards strengthening cities as they emerge as important actors in all areas. And we saw that um, especially in the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic, <clears throat> the role of cities have become uh, more important. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, say this and uh, just to assure that Turkey will uh, keep working with all partners in implementing SDG 7 and advocating for uh, the strengthening of um, the role of cities. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Damla, also for being admirably uh, brief and, and, and to the point. Now, uh, Joseph, uh, have you managed to get uh, my good friend Jan? He has not reached him. Uh, he's trying to reconnect and he has not tried to reconnect yet. We're still looking for him. Thank you. Okay. Then what I will do when and looking a little bit at my good friend and colleague, Taya, uh, one of the co-chairs of the group of Friends of, uh, of, uh, of Sustainable Energy, who wanted to take the floor and I suppose express uh, something on behalf of all four co-chairs. Taya, you have the floor. Well, uh, th thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. And uh, I just took the floor to extend my sincere uh, appreciation uh, to the Castilian uh, prepared the uh, uh, the progress report. And uh, okay, we lost his audio. Uh, can you hear me? You can't hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Now we can, yes. yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, I took the floor. Thank you very much, Martina, to thank the, uh, particularly the Castilian agencies for preparing the, uh, uh, the, the, the report. And uh, the report uh, will show us indeed where we stand and the challenges we face, particularly at this, uh, in the midst of the COVID, and also the opportunities we should seize uh, to build the uh, momentum. Uh, uh, you know, as many uh, speakers uh, have uh, clearly elicited uh, and probably even amplified uh, on the basis of data that renewable energy uh, even on the most difficult circumstance where we're in, uh, and the, the most resilient energy uh, resources. Uh, therefore, uh, we have to keep it real. Uh, you know, if we look at uh, for Sub-Saharan Africans, uh, you know, more than 85% uh, of the 620 million people that doesn't have electric city live in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, as David uh, from IA has also put it, uh, even uh, clean cooking, uh, you know, access remains low in, uh, in the political agenda of many countries and 2.3 billion people would still, uh, are still dependent on uh, biomass sources. That indeed justifies that uh, uh, sustainable and clean energy is indeed the way forward. So uh, for Africa, sustainable energy, many sub-Saharan Africa, singly the entire Africa is all about having a decent life, living in a dignified uh, manner, even a life worth of living. And of course it is uh, about jobs. It is about unlocking our potentials and also uh, you know, uh, electricity access is indeed crucial uh, for uh, many of the uh, countries in, in the sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, as my minister has put it, the, uh, the Grand Rensand Dam is, is just an asset to regional cooperation as a major non-sustainable energy resource is about integration, not a, a cause of misunderstanding. It is even designed as one of the continental projects to strengthen regional integration under the projects for infrastructure development in Africa. And uh, definitely we will continue to work with our brothers and sisters to reach a win-win uh, outcome. That's how we see it. Uh, again, my words of thanks to the, uh, uh, the Castilian uh, agencies who prepared the report. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you so much, Ty. Um, it doesn't look like we've been able to connect uh, our, our Austrian colleague. Is that correct, Joseph? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm keep checking. I don't believe so. Okay. Well, it's a shame. Uh, Jan is always worth listening to. Uh, I suppose the good news is that it's not the last time we're going to be discussing sustainable energy, which of course, and, and this, uh, these are my closing remarks, and then I'm going to thank all of you for your, your patience with, with uh, my inept uh, moderation. But SDG 7 sits at the intersection, if you like, of Agenda 2030 and the Paris uh, Agreement. We need to get energy right. 
because if we don't, we're not going to deliver on either. Um, as I said, uh, there are going to be a lot of events uh, and a lot of uh, processes where we're going to be discussing this at high level. And then we must make sure we use all of 2020 to, uh, to generate the kind of momentum which is needed to deliver on what we know we can do, uh, because it has been done. But now it must be done at a bigger scale and much uh, faster. And we must do so, of course, with a view uh, not only to, uh, to the high-level dialogue on energy uh, convened by the Secretary General uh, next year mandated by UN member states, but also, of course, towards uh, COP, uh, COP26. These are indeed trying times, but they are also defining times. Uh, and uh, I think in the words of Under Secretary General Liu, it's time to step up. The data is there, the science is clear, the business case is good, now it's time to deliver. Thank you so much, all of you, for uh, tuning in uh, and participating uh, in this. Uh, let's use uh, the SDG 7 tracking report and the policy briefs to inform not only what we say, but what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. It was very well done. Very useful. <laughs> Thank you.